One of the things that has been a constant in aviation throughout my career since I was a student pilot, people have been freaking out that the test is about to change. <laughs> and of course, the knowledge test, the FAA does make edits every three months and they always have. And it might just be some punctuation and it might be the change of a value, a, a, a number or whatever, or they might introduce new questions as they did years ago when a whole bunch of new icing questions came in. But right now we're facing a whole new stack of airman certification standards and practical test standards that are all going to go active on May 31st. Is this a good time for us to freak out, Pat? Not freak out, but here they all are. I've printed, believe it or not, printed them all out. In fact, here's the, here, this, here's the other one here. That I, <laughs> I printed all of these things out off of the FAA website just so I could start uh, looking at them and making sure that I understand uh, what the changes are because largely, I mean, in, in a kind of a global way, uh, things are much the same. But there are some differences. So I think that's what we're going to be talking about today. Well, and I think maybe the big takeaway for students, take this seriously and, and CFIs as well, because there are changes. And if you are planning on taking a check ride in June and using the practical test standard or ACS you were using back in May and April, that could be a problem. But it's not like they introduced the new dipsy doodle approach or something that you never heard of. It's just there's there's going to be some new language. There's going to be some new standards. And it is incumbent on the applicant and the CFI and the DPE to be up to speed on May 31st going forward. Yeah, I'm already telling people, and, and it's, it's on my website, um, that uh, anything that's done on May 31st or after, it's not June 1, it's on May 31st, um, that uh, it will be conducted according to the new ACS. And one of, the, one of the big changes is that the CFI PTS is now a CFI ACS. Now that that's the, that's probably the hugest, if that's the right even the right a, a word, uh, the the hugest change is that, um, and there there are there's a significant change in the instrument uh, ACS with regard to approaches that are allowed uh, to be done on the check ride. So uh, if especially if you're an instrument student and you're going to be taking this uh, test after uh, on or after May 31st. You want to look in the uh, in the in the appendix on on that particular one. And another thing that they've done is they actually took a, a bunch of the information that was published in every single uh, PTS or ACS, I should say, and they've actually separated that out into another document that's called the Airman Certification Standards Companion Guide for Pilots. And so that's again, I've just printed this off of the FAA website, but. Um, I, I assume that at some point you'll be able to buy this from one of the repackagers like ASA or one of those kind of places in a, in, in, in a booklet form, but I don't know that. I didn't want to wait, so I just went ahead and printed all that stuff out. I, I think actually uh, at least ASA, I believe, is already starting to pre-sell that sort of thing, um, which makes sense. And, you know, I remember the PTS was totally confusing to me when I first got into this. It, it wasn't until I got into instrument training that I sort of understood what it was. I really do think the ACS was a huge leap forward because you've got the knowledge area and the task and the tolerances and the risk assessment. So it really makes it very clear. We're, we're testing multiple things here. It's not just, can you do that? But it's like, why are we doing this? And what's the issue with this? And what do we have to be careful of? And you know, it really shows a more holistic understanding of what's going on with the aircraft, with the pilot in the system. Yeah. You know, when the ACS first came out, um, it was like, why are they messing with something that was perfectly good to begin with? Uh, I have kind of slowly come around to uh, uh, liking uh, the ACS. If it's used properly, um, you know, it, it, they, they change the parameters. Uh, uh, with the ACS, you have to test uh, at least one knowledge element, and there are usually multiple knowledge elements on, in, in a given task uh, or a given area of operation. Uh, 
you have to test one knowledge element, you have to test one uh, uh, risk element, and you have to test all of the skill elements. Um, and, and actually that gives us a little bit more flexibility uh, in conducting um, a practical test uh, check ride um, than the old PTS did. So, um, and, and, and if I didn't mention it already, I, I think I did, but I'm getting old. Uh, uh, but the, uh, the CFI is now an ACS as well. So that again, yeah. gives us some, some additional flexibility that, uh, that we didn't necessarily have under the old PTS uh, practical test standards. So bottom line is uh, this, this affects um, DPEs, flight instructors, and, uh, and, and students, essentially everybody. Uh, so you need to be aware of it. This is one of the things that I'm most fascinated by. Assuming I've done my research correctly, I believe in the new ACS PTS, I'm allowed to use an electronic flight bag to plan across country. I don't have to do it on paper. That's correct. But if that concerns somebody, could I call my DPE or just meet up with them someplace and say, hey, how do you want me to proceed with this? Can I do this on an iPad or do you want to see it on paper? What's, what's your best advice to somebody for the new era? Well, I think regardless of whether it's the old era or new era, if, if you have a, t- a check ride coming up and you have any concerns or questions about anything, uh, it is absolutely um appropriate to ask to have a conversation with your examiner. Um, first of all, it demystifies things a little bit if you've never met him or her before uh, to realize that we don't have horns and a tail, you know, and we really we really do want to pass you. So if you have any, any questions, I mean, obviously I'm not going to tell you the questions I'm going to ask you, but because you've got the subject areas that that you're that you're responsible for knowing in the ACS, so there'll be no surprises there. But yeah, um, you know, personally, I like to see the uh, the check the uh, uh, cross countries on the private and commercial done on paper. And the only reason for that is that it's just easier to lay the paper out on the table and get a really big picture of what's happening. It's a little bit more challenging when you've got to kind of pinch and squeeze and do all that kind of stuff and move the map around on the iPad to uh, to get to, to all the things that we want to talk about. But it's not impossible. It's just not quite as convenient. Um, but I can tell you, and so, so if, if, while I ask for paper, I'm perfectly happy to do something on the iPad. But if they're going to use the iPad to plan the flight, which means the flight log and all of those other things, then we're going to be having a pretty uh, in-depth discussion about what does for flight do for you? What do they take into account? You know, the numbers that they spit out, how do they get there? Because it's important that applicants understand kind of the, you know, how the sausage is made. Um, and if they don't, you know, that's a p- potential area for disapproval. And yes, they can use electronic flight bags, um, if, if an applicant opts to use uh, an iPad in flight, which, which almost all of them do, in my experience, over the last several years anyway, um, we will disable the ownership function, which kills the GPS function. We'll also kill breadcrumbs and distance rings and glide advisor. And I think there's one other thing that I'll kill because if you don't, those things still appear on the screen moving around, you know, the breadcrumbs will appear out of nowhere, even though there's no airplane, you know, in front of it. Um, so we, we will make it just a sectional chart because currently, unless that has ever changed, um, two of the elements or two of the areas of operation in the, in the, uh, both the commercial and, uh, a private uh, uh, ACS call for pilotage and dead reckoning, which means you can't hit enter nearest direct go go. You, ca- you can't you can't do that, which means you can't do it on your iPad either. So you know once we get through the pilotage and dead reckoning exercise, that is the cross country portion of the diversion. As far as I'm concerned, they can re re enable ownership if they want to. Um, most of them don't think to do it, and we really don't need it, but. Uh, um, yes, but the, the, the very long answer to your statement was, yes, you can use EF, EFBs at this point, but the caveat is you better know how to use them. I like that. So the, the big takeaway from this is, yes, 
the Airman Certification and Practical Test Standards are being reissued. They're, they're renewed, and that starts on May 31st, not June 1st. We don't have to have a mental breakdown over this because there's no. nothing dramatically new. It's it's just the presentation of it, a little bit of text change here and there. And right. it's perfectly okay to talk to your CFI and make sure you're up to speed and to even talk to your DPE in advance of a check ride to find out exactly what's expected of you and prepare for it in advance. Yep, exactly. Great advice, Jamie. As always, you are full of wisdom. <laughs> They're full of other things too, but wisdom is one. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, this is one of those things that, as I say, and I'm sure it's true for you too, as long as I've been in this business, and maybe because I've made my career as a flight instructor and writing and that sort of thing, I've met people throughout my career who are just freaked out that there's about to be a change in the test, and they get themselves all wrapped up that there's going to be something dramatically new that they've never heard of before, and that's just not how it works. No. It, these are really small changes. Well, we were talking earlier when I came through and I suspect when you came through, we didn't do slow flight. We did minimum controllable airspeed where any change in pitch or bank or power would result in a stall. Right. So we would often have the nose on the 152 so high, the airspeed indicator read zero yeah. and the horn is screaming and you just use the tiniest bit of rudder to get a turn going. Right. Well, then they changed it to slow flight and things changed. That's the thing. It's nuances. It's it's slight changes that we have a slightly different parameter, a different tolerance. But it's not like, oh, now you're going to have to do an inverted loop over the airfield to an emergency descent and landing power off. No, no. <laughs> as, as much as I think that would be fun, uh, <laughs> it's... It, <laughs> it's it's not on the ACS. Now, nothing nothing that extreme. The 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 basic stuff um, largely remains the same. Um, I'm I'm actually going through all of these things um, as we speak and highlighting on my printed copy uh, off the off the FA website. My printed copy. I'm highlighting the changes. Um, uh, just putting it side by side of the the current ACS and highlighting the changes, um, so that I can so that I can speak to that if somebody asks the question. This is breaking news, Pat. Are you saying that as a designated pilot examiner across the board, y'all are not just ogres who are looking for the opportunity? Oh, you were three knots off your airspeed. That's a bust. You actually prepare for these check rides as well. You review the standards that you're testing to. You know, people. <laughs> the answer is yes, but <laughs> but 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 as always, there's more to it, Jamie. This, this uh, suddenly seems like congressional testimony. <laughs> well, it, it, it yes, yes, Mr. Ambassador. Um, you know what what applicants see at the check ride is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we have to do to prepare for that. Um, we are required to prepare a plan of action for every single check ride we do for the individual. It's not, we don't have just a cookie cutter piece of paper and we're going to check boxes as we go. We actually have to prepare a plan of action. And it's based on obviously the, the ACS for the check ride we're doing. Uh, we also have to, we also have to take a look at the um, uh, knowledge test results and even though the flight instructors are tasked with the endorsement that says we've covered the areas found to be deficient, so there's an endorsement, the 6139 endorsement that we have to make sure is there, we have to cover that stuff too. So um, now, l let's just say that, that um, you were deficient in one particular area that, that the ACS says I have to ask you about regardless. Okay, well, we can do that you know, one in the same. I mean, I've covered what, what the ACS says I got to cover and I've covered the deficiency all in one question, for example. But let's say that, that there's something that I hadn't planned to cover in the ACS because it's maybe it's, maybe it's not one of the, one of the, one of the knowledge or risk areas that I was planning to cover with you, Jamie, uh, for your, for yours. Uh, but, 
But when I get a copy of your knowledge test, which I get in advance, um, it shows that you were weak in that area over there. Well, I'm probably still going to ask you about this area, but now I got to ask you about that one too. And remember the ACS says at least one knowledge element and at least one risk element doesn't mean that doesn't say that only one, mm -hmm. it says at least one, which means, you know, if you're struggling in a particular area of operation uh, on the one thing that I ask you, I'm probably going to ask you something else on, on that same list of things that are in that area, of, a task in that area of operation. And depending on how you do that, I may ask you something else. And even yet beyond that, and let's just see how shallow or deep that knowledge really is. And it could possibly uh, result in a, in a disapproval, but I don't, I don't, I really don't want to dwell on that. I want to really dwell on the fact that, that we have to, create a plan of action based on the ACS and based on your knowledge test. So if, if, if there's a motivation to do better than just 70%, which is passing for your knowledge test, I would say that's it because it can lengthen your, your oral. It may not, but it certainly can lengthen your oral because remember, if you, if you get 70%, that's 30% of the test that I got to cover with you. You know, that opens the door to an interesting question. I just talked to a kid the other day who's studying for his oral. Yeah. And let's say theoretically, applicant A comes in and got a 72 on their written. And applicant B comes in and got a 98 on their written. Tell me if I'm wrong on this. These are not going to be dramatically different oral exams, but there will be a little more in-depth, you know, asking more questions on the applicant with the 72 because you've got to check where they're, they're weak. But if between the time of my written and now, I worked well with my CFI, I watched videos, I read, I got up to speed, and you asked me those two or three questions, and I can just give you very concise, accurate answers, we're moving on, Right. This is not a case where, oh, you got a 72, your oral is going to be four hours long. Well, we, we, we may, well, let's just say that, that airspace maybe is, is one of the, it just says airspace. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I mean, I cover that anyway, uh, during, during a, during a, a commercial and private oral in particular. Um, so, all right, well, I can kind of piggyback the deficiencies on the knowledge test with the um, uh, with something that I that I typically ask anyway, so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be um, a longer oral as a result. But if they if they're not doing well on that, even though their instructor has uh, gone over it with them and and they've watched YouTube videos or whatever, it it could I may have to dig a little bit deeper to find out really how deep does their knowledge go um, if. Um, I, I, I'm not coming up with any really good examples right now, but uh, again, the short the short answer is that getting a 72 doesn't necessarily mean that the oral is going to be longer than if you get a 98, but it does mean that I've got to make sure that I cover those areas of deficiency, and if they're not on what I had planned to cover with you, I've got to add that to it. You know, it just occurs to me as you're talking about this with airspace, we should probably do an episode just on echo because I'm <laughs> willing to bet an awful lot of people are kind of a little fuzzy on echo airspace. And if I'm not wrong, Pat, there's eight different kinds of echo airspace. If you hadn't said it, I was going to say it myself. There's eight <laughs> different kinds of echo airspace. And, and oh, so something to look forward to. We're going to have to do one on echo airspace just to freak people out because that's a real thing. It is a real and, thing. Any closing remarks, Mr. DPE, with the new ACS PTS coming out May 31st, 2024? Effective May 31st, not June 1st. It's effective May 31st. You can go to FAA.gov. Now I sound like some uh, ad huckster on TV. You can go to FAA.gov. And in fact, if you go to Google and you just uh, uh, type in FAA new practical test standards, or excuse me, new uh, airman certification standards or something like that, 
<clears throat> you'll actually get a link right to their website. And it's it's on the uh, on the certification page, the testing and certification page. And if you kind of scroll down, you'll see, um, I think the, the date you'll see is November 23rd, but in the next column, it says effective May 31st, 2024. Those are the ones that you're looking for. And uh, don't freak out. Um, the only one of the one of the really substantial changes, though, and I will without getting too much into the weeds here, is that the instrument practical test standards have been rewritten in such a way that you actually could take an entire instrument check ride with nothing but GPS in your panel. You got to do three different types of approaches, but so which would be like an LP, an LPV, and an RNAV, uh, an LNAV, I'm sorry, an LPV, an LP, and an, and an LNAV, for example, would be three different kinds of approaches in the new ACS. So that's a pretty substan- substantial change, but um, don't freak out, read the ACS. Um, you'll be pleasantly surprised that other than some some wording uh, changes, some omissions of some words and things like that, um, it's it's largely pretty much what we're used to. Pat, I can't thank you enough for shining a light on this. I find it fascinating when they do updates like this, and I know it makes people nervous, but I think you've provided some clarity that makes life better for all of us. So with that, I know viewers will be in just so excited to click the like button because you taught them something really new. They will share this video on social media just to let people know they're ahead of the curve and subscribe to the channel because why wouldn't you subscribe to a channel where Pat Brown gives you the inside the inside <laughs> scoop on whatever's coming up in advance. Remember when I said earlier, you were full of stuff, um, <laughs> including helpful information. This Remember is not the helpful information. You were I I yeah, know this at least how to say, go to FAA.gov, but wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. We'll see you back here next time, and maybe we'll talk about Echo Airspace. Adios, buddy.